it grew. And there are good things in it, uh, regard for the best things of the past, desire to build on the Russian past and not to borrow from the West, but very negative things as well, as well a chauvinistic attitude to other nationalities, anti-Semitism. Anti the church, in fact, has disowned the organisation, even though many of its members claim that they are orthodox. We have to recognise that Glasnost will throw up bad things as well as good. <coughs> or even those who say that the KGB encourages an anti-Semitic organisation, uh, a nationalistic organisation like Panyard, uh, as a deliberate attempt to discredit Glasnost so that they can say in the future, well, look, if, if you allow people to express their views freely, you get these negative influences in society. That could even be an argument in the future, if anyone wants to use it for cracking down again on glassness. Let's hope not. Now, none of this ferment of debate and discussion finds the slightest echo in official church circles. The image of itself, which the Orthodox Church, and for that matter the other official religious bodies in the Soviet Union, present to the world, is of a church where everybody thinks the same, <coughs> which happens to coincide with what the Soviet government thinks, on every issue. And so you have really very extensive contacts now um, between churches all around the world and the Russian Orthodox Church and the Soviet Union and some of the other churches. And these, these have been increasing ever since the post-war period. It's a deliberate government policy. One of the prices which the church pays for having any open, above-ground institutional church life at all is to support Soviet policy at all points, particularly foreign policy, and particularly the peace policy. And in fact, I should really distinguish between the two, because policy on peace is Soviet foreign policy by another name. And the church has to support it. It doesn't just have to keep quiet and not disagree with it. It must actively, and at every possible opportunity, support it. And so in these increasing international contact, this bland, unanimous voice is the only one that's heard totally unrepresentative of the church as a whole. And I find it really very difficult indeed to see how so many people in the West, particularly those who actually meet these people in, in ecumenical circles, can possibly believe that this is true. Not only because of the fairly obvious coincidence of what the church is saying and what the Soviet state is saying, which applies to hardly any representatives of Western churches. They don't feel the need to support what their governments are saying, usually rather the contrary. But how anyone from a Western church can believe that all the bishops in the Russian Orthodox Church or any other church all agree with each other all the time is absolutely beyond me. And therefore, none of the creative ideas, innovative ideas, which Russian Christians, Ukrainian Christians, Belarusian Christians and others within the Orthodox Church are coming up with, find any echo at all in ecumenical circles. Um, and, and therefore the totality of views, the richness of views, which that church has, are just ignored by international church bodies and in the ecumenical movement at large. And this is a serious lack for the ecumenical movement itself, as well as an affront and a cause of, of grief to Christians in Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere in the Soviet Union. They feel they're being ignored by Christians of the West, as well as being stifled by their own government. Now, within the Soviet Union, ecumenism between the churches on an official level is, is limited. There has there's been very little leisure 
after all, during decades of persecution and discrimination, for theological talks and discussions of finding out what they have in common. There's a certain amount of that, but it's fair to say that there's been virtually no theological moving together at all between the main groups, the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Protestants. But that doesn't mean that there's no bond between them, that there's no real ecumenism. And where you find that is in the Gulag. Because if you're a prisoner for many years, and you're a Baptist, and the, the prisoner in the next bank to you is a Catholic, it's what you have in common that is important, not what divides you. And it's your witness and your relationship to the other prisoners, the non-Christians, who are locked up with you for years on end and cannot get away from your Christian witness, that's important. So the Gulag is a mission field. And the Gulag is a place where real ecumenism is forged. And that surely has a lesson for all of our churches in the West. And that is what the ecumenical <coughs> movement in the West is depriving itself of. Because you're told when you talk about prisoners, you're told when you talk about persecution, that you are going to make relations worse with the Russian Orthodox Church or with the Soviet Baptist Church. You're told that you're upsetting the ecumenical apple cart by bringing in these um, unpleasant things instead of concentrating on what's possible, on, on, on what's positive, and on trying to work out how we can draw churches closer together. Are we not in danger of ignoring the real ecumenism that's being forged by those who have their suffering in common in in, in, uh, and, and grasping instead at a a rather thin, a rather paltry, a rather stitched together of humanism worked out in conferences around the world. So, there is a sense, and I, I don't want to overstate it, but there is a sense in which the Orthodox Church in the Soviet Union, on the eve of this millennium, is very seriously divided divided in its views over the best stance for the church to adopt, both vis-a-vis -vis the authorities and vis-a-vis -vis Christians in other countries. And divided over the role that the church may be able to play in the country in the future. Everyone, I think, who's a member of that church agrees that it has always been important in the history and the culture and the life of the country and must go on being so in future. But over tactics, there are differences. Now, I say I don't want to overstate this, I do not think there are serious spiritual or theological divisions. I think on the basics of the faith, the assumptions are common. I think in the sense that being part of a, per a community that is a terrible person, probably more sustained and bitter and brutal persecution than any other church, has ever had to endure. There's a feeling of being part of a community that survived all that and come through it. And there isn't a formal ecclesiological division in that there been, hasn't been recently anyway a split in the church in the way that there has among the Baptists. So formally there is unity. But as I say, in terms of their view of the future, there are these divisions. And the millennium celebrations next June promise to be a very splendid and a very moving, a very spiritual occasion. I think there will be wonderful services which those who are present at them will remember all their lives. And I know from my own experiences worshipping the Orthodox churches in Moscow and Leningrad and Kiev and elsewhere, that it was a tremendous privilege to be there worshipping with those <coughs> believers. And this will be increased a hundredfold and a thousandfold in June. And I know I've, I've been in churches, and again, as Michael said this morning, they're not show churches, they're not facade churches. They're real, the worship is real, intense, devout. They're only facades in the sense that people think it's like that throughout the whole country when it isn't. But one can look around in those churches at people, at older people, 
and you can see their faces lined with suffering. You know what they lived through in the 20s and the 30s. You know that they must have spent many years when they thought that they would never go to a church again in their lives. And now over those lines of suffering you can, or through those lines of suffering, you can see the joy coming through that they have a church that they can go to week by week, day by day, in some cases. And it's a very moving experience to join with them. And I, for one, and many other Christians around the world, next June, will be joining in prayer and in joy and in thankfulness with those believers as they celebrate their thousand years of Christianity. But the, the celebrations are not going to be very extensive. They last perhaps a month. Why not a whole year of celebration? The state, I think, is confining the celebrations to more or less the minimum that it thinks it can get away with. So in the last year or so, there have been some signs of, of that broadening out from the original plan from the millennium, which was probably began to be worked out about 1983 or 1984. We still have to remember all those hundreds of thousands of Christians who won't be able to get to a church for the millennium celebration unless they travel hundreds of miles to get there. We still have to remember all those who will regret the rather misleading impression of their church that will be given to foreign visitors who attend. And many Christians throughout the country know that the authorities will use the Millennium Celebrations, this wonderful occasion for them, deliberately as a means of propaganda about the supposed freedom of religion in the Soviet Union. Let's not forget to pray with them and to sorrow with them that their church is still not, despite recent changes, anything like completely free. Because still, the bishops, whatever they may think in their hearts of hearts, and I think the bishops all have very different views about things. I don't think they are as, as homogeneous as we often take them to be. But whatever they really think, they're still not free to speak out. And it's the lay people, the lay people who are willing to run the risks, who have to shoulder that burden and who have to articulate what they are feeling, what the soul of their church is experiencing. That still continues to be the case. But I found among the people that I met that their hopes were not limited, their vision was not limited by the appalling difficulty under which they have to live, even when they lose their jobs, even when they have a menial job on which it's hard to support a family, even when a bright student is thrown out of university because they make no secret of their faith, even when they're interrogated by the KGB and otherwise discriminated against. Their vision for the future of their country is not dimmed. They think big, these people. The Orthodox Times <coughs> talk about the, the Christianization of the whole of their country. They don't use the word evangelism or proselytization that we might use. The word they use in Russian is Christianization. They have a vision of their country, the countries which make up the Soviet Union, being Christianized so that Christian values form the basis of their future life. Now what vision must that take? It's hard enough to imagine that in Britain, isn't it? With all the freedoms that we have, with all the opportunities that they have. And yet, they do. This is how they look to the future. They are not discouraged. Vladimir Porish was a young Christian who came to the faith after a series of terrible psychological and intellectual struggles. And again, like Tatiana Gorich, over whom I mentioned earlier, got very involved in one of the Christian discussion groups that drew in many others, drew in many others and brought them to the faith. But he was arrested and sent to labor camp, so he's free again now. And at his trial, the judge said to him, what is it that you want, you people? And he said, we want the whole world. And the judge said, what? What do you want? He said, we want the whole world. Imagine coming decades of persecution. You'd expect him to say, well, I hope we can clear
moving on to the end of my lifetime, people who are in churches and perhaps open one or two more. Oh no, they have a much larger vision than that. Now, I began by saying that this could be a time of hope, a time of cautious hope. When I first went to the Soviet Union in the 70s, that really was a time of hope. The dissent movement, in its very broadest sense, the non-conformist movement, the movement of people who fought for themselves instead of thinking what they were told to think, was at its height. Many people were working in different ways for freedom of expression, be it freedom to publish uh, more open literature, uh, publish their views more openly in literature, officially published literature, be it people fighting for the rights of Jews to emigrate or of Germans to emigrate, be it of those working for greater human rights, whatever it was, it was a time of hope, it was a time of action. And I met a lot of different people, and they really thought that things could change. For the first time in Soviet history, they thought that things could really change. Oh, they knew they'd have to pay for it. They knew they'd have to go to labor camps. It was worth it if things changed. And they placed a lot of hopes upon the West, upon Western governments and others. And the Christians, the Orthodox Christians that I met, placed a lot of hope upon Western Christians and Western churches. They thought if we knew what their lives were like, we would help them. They thought if they got out the truth about their situation to us, the Western churches would respond in a way that the Soviet authorities would have to take account of. And as I went back and forth, I went ten times altogether before they stopped giving me visas, I found their hopes beginning to be shaken. And they would say to me, why aren't Western Christians responding to our appeals? Why aren't they doing wrong? And I tried to explain, you know, well, not everybody in the West quite understands your position, and some of them believe the official church leaders that you have here. And I said, why? How can anyone believe them? Surely they can understand our situation. And I tried to encourage them and say, well, you know, in Parliament, one or two people are showing interest now, which they didn't do before. And in Congress in the USA, we've, we've heard some encouraging noises. And I tried to encourage them and cheer them up. But even as I was doing it, I could see the hope fading from their eyes. And the lack of support, the lack of sufficient support in time in the West was, I think, one of the reasons why from 1978 onwards, the Soviet authorities thought that they could crush the dissent movement. And they deliberately decided to crush it by arresting all the leading activists and giving them very long sentences. And to all intents and purposes, they did crush it. So, let us hope and let us pray that their hopes of Christians in the Orthodox Church on the eve of this momentous occasion, and Christians in the other churches too, will not be disappointed again. Roland said this morning that he always found it very difficult to ask for money. I don't find it difficult at all because I have looked people in the eye. In Moscow, in Leningrad, I have looked people in the eye who knew that within six months they would be in labor camp. And I have had to say to them, we hear what you are asking us to do at Keston College to help you. And we can't do it because we haven't got the money. And that is something that I never want to have to do again. Because I felt ashamed. talked about our response this morning in comparison with the Jews. I felt ashamed then too, I expect many of you did too. Let us not let that happen again. And let us keep the Orthodox Church, the other churches in Moscow, in the Soviet Union, in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our active concern after the millennium celebration after the spotlight fades from the sea and the international church leaders go on to some other celebration in some other country because that is when we will really find out what the future holds for Christians in the Soviet Union.
to point out that that was a profound and moving address from Jane Ellis, and one that I'm sure touched us all. There is time for some questions, and while uh, you are perhaps gathering your thoughts, maybe I might use Chairman's privilege to ask the first one. And uh, the question I would like to ask is indeed about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Because, Jane, you made some very interesting points about it. You said that in contrast to Russia, where the intellectuals are going back to Orthodox Christianity, they, they feel so attracted to it, drawn to it, you say this is happening less in the Soviet Union, in the Ukraine, for the reason that it is tainted with, with Russia because uh, it's the Russian Orthodox Church, not the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And the question I wanted to ask is this. Do you think that with the millennial celebrations, especially those in Kiev, where Ukrainians will again think of the foundation of their church a thousand years ago, beginnings of Christianity a thousand years ago, that they, that might be the stimulus to a rebirth of Ukrainian intellectual interest in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Do you see that as a possible stimulus uh, to a renewed Ukrainian interest? Um, I, think, I think it it could very well be. Um, it's hard, isn't it, because anniversaries of, of this kind are there's very often a sort of artificiality about them. I mean, nobody actually knows for certain that the baptism of Bruce was in 1910. Um, the, the chronicles are unclear. It could well have been in 989. Um, and there were Christians in the region before that anyway. Um, but nonetheless, the celebration by a group, a large group of people, of an event of this kind, does make people think fresh and does make them look to the past and to see what survives of the past, or what can be resurrected from the past. So I think this could very well happen, but will nonetheless be bedeviled by the lack of a, a form of expression, the lack of a, a church, which could be the, the focus of, of, of uh, existing aspirations, as well as perhaps newly awakened aspirations. And that, again, Michael, I think, answered a, a, a similar question this morning. It does depend on whether the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, as well as the Ukrainian Catholic Church, might be able to be legalized. But I suppose we might perhaps see the, the growth of informal groups, like the ones I'm describing in Moscow and Leningrad, and, and indeed other cities, but it's only in Moscow and Leningrad that we have a certain amount of information about them. That, that might well happen amongst people who are engaged in preserving, because that's what it amounts to, Ukrainian culture, and preserving and continuing to create the Ukrainian literature. And it might well be that they would um, take on board the, what the heritage of Ukrainian orthodoxy has, has to offer. Let, let us hope so. Thank you. Sir, so, may I ask a question? Yes. Okay, you first. Okay. Yes. Can I stop you on that I'm very honoured to be here. It's a two-pronged question, really, so this one is, is it not true, as I understand it, on listening and on information that I have gathered over a few years, that the Soviet principle or lack of principle of enforcing the dispersal of people, tending for, say, Russians, as may be regarded as Russians as opposed to Ukrainians, being infiltrated into and watering down the body of the real Ukrainians, may I say that respectfully, and the Ukrainians themselves being dispersed in the greater extent of the Soviet Union, even we use terms that are rather hurtful to me, and I suppose to all of us, when we talk of Siberia, we always think of something rather horrible, but even as far as that, could that not well be such that when we say the established <coughs> church of the Ukraine has been deliberately watered down in effect from an atheistic 
principle, or lack of it, which has enforced that watering down weakness in an established church. Now, I'll couple it with this if I may, because I think you could probably do it. Looking back, you did mention, well, in the early 10th century, when they had a very militant dictator, and into that militant dictatorship came, I believe they were called the Byzantine missions. From what source they came, or several sources, I, I honestly don't know. And I would ask the sign of, or the knowledge of that, in that sense that you say, looking back and taking knowledge and comfort and a source of inspiration to make it real and vital. And I said that very humbly because I think that's a little, very watered down here today. Before you answer, Jane, perhaps we should repeat the question so that people heard it. First was about the dispersal of nationalities around the Soviet Union and this watered down national entity of Ukraine. The second was about a, a parallel between the Byzantine missionaries in the early 10th century and what might happen today. Yes, the, um, the dilution of Ukrainian and other national groups by Russians in the Soviet Union is, is a deliberate policy. Russians are being moved into non uh, have been, the, I suppose, in the post war period, really. Um, so for 40 years, Russians have been deliberately moved in to Ukraine, to the Baltic, uh, and to Soviet Central Asia. I, it seems to me actually that the Baltic countries, all three of them, have probably suffered most from this simply by being smaller, by having smaller populations. Um, and the use of, of Russian as an official language uh, in many parts of everyday life as opposed to the local language, which was mentioned this morning, is of course a, uh, an affront to many. It is, uh, in a sense, there's nothing especially communist about it. Um, it's what all empires do. Um, and this is an aspect of empire rather than an aspect of, of, um, of, of communism. But it is a, a deliberate policy. The moving of non-Russian nationalities to other areas is less marked today, as far as I know. I don't pretend to be an expert on this. But most of the deportation of nationalities, of course, took place after the war ended Stalin, when, again, from the Baltic countries, which I think suffered most by virtue of their small populations. They were moved to Soviet Central Asia and Siberia, as of course were Ukrainians. Um, I, this happened, and Crimean Tatars being another example. Um, now this ha doesn't happen so much now, it doesn't certainly happen in a, a forcible way. There is a need to attract labour to Siberia from all parts of the Soviet Union because of the need to exploit natural resources. This is done by offering very high wages and, and Soviet citizens of all nationalities may choose whether or not to respond to that. So that adds a bit to the, um, the melting pot factor, but it is all quite deliberate. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question about um, Byzantium. Just, well, going back to the 10th century, when Mm. May I say, I understand this, and I'm obviously one of your professional advice for it, and not mm. on the fact that was it not Lithuania then and the people as such that really began to emerge in that period when that dictator came and through his, or during his dictatorship, also coincidental with that or whatever, were Byzantine missions from which source I would out of interest like to know and their influence, what was it? Is it sim was it similar then to what it is now? And could they not take inspiration from looking back and reinforce their inspirational movement now? Well, I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think when they when they look back to what happened in the 10th century, um, I think it probably is a source of some inspiration to the people who, to the Christians who derived their origins from uh, the events of that time. It wasn't, in fact, so much missionaries from Byzantium. Uh, that was more the case in, in Bulgaria and other areas round about, where, of course, we had the great educators of the Slavs or illuminators of the Slavs, Cyril and Methodius, who, um, who did come from Byzantium bringing the Christian faith. And indeed, it was Cyril, the divisor of the present-day Russian alphabet, who gave his name to it as the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, but Christianity came to Kiev and Rus as a result of the decision by the, the ruler, Prince Vladimir or Volodymyr, uh, to 
Christianize his nation and to baptize his people. And certainly the influence from Byzantium, the teaching from Byzantium, was, was, uh, was strong. But then again, as Michael Bordeaux was mentioning this morning, there followed a period of centuries when the church was cut off from the West. So that tradition is, is not as strong as it might otherwise have been. Mr. Rappel. Miss Harry spoke to us here about the ordinary day school. I think we indulged that we spent time in the area. But I would like to raise the question about the hierarchy, the leadership of the International Orthodox Church. They always seem to be apologetic about what the Soviet government is doing. Now, I never heard anybody of them spoke in the temple of those that were sentenced to the way they did your belief. And in fact, what they say is that there is no persecution. In the, Soviet, uh, in the Soviet Union, not the Jewish religion. And on the other hand, the same church is very hostile to the other church, who is that like the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Orthodox. And the Russian Orthodox Church, or the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church, they took the same part, probably 50 50, in liquidating the Ukrainian Catholic Church. So, what the question now is, is the thinking of ordinary Russian festival any better than the leadership? Again, perhaps we should repeat the question that Mr. Rappelman was asking about the leadership yeah. of the Orthodox Church, given this, this rebirth amongst some at least of the ordinary members of the Russian Orthodox Church. Is, does that really affect any of the leaders, or are all the leaders simply serving the state? Working out what Russian Orthodox Church leaders really mean when they open their mouths and speak about their church is a fine art. <laughs> Complicated by the fact that, as I said earlier, they do genuinely disagree with each other sometimes and have different views as you'd expect from anybody, people either inside or outside the church. Um, there are some who probably tell lies and don't think twice about it. I think it's as simple as that. There are others who will make a fine calculation and say, we don't want to tell lies, but if that's the price of keeping our church with a limited amount of freedom, so that there are churches for the faithful to come to where we, will, where we can minister to them, then we don't like it, but we are prepared to do it. <coughs> but I think there's also another element, which is quite often overlooked in the West, you see, I think a lot of, not so much, well, yes, even today, but more so in the past, the average Soviet reader reading a newspaper doesn't look for what's there. He looks for what's not there. Re literally reading between the lines. Um, and they've learned to talk in this way. It's a, a horrific thing, actually, that the, the people's minds have to work in this convoluted way. It's one of the less obvious aspects of persecution. But they get used to talking in this way and they expect us to be able to understand what they really mean. Now a Soviet bishop might well say, that, might well think to himself that if he gets up and says something really outrageous in the West like there is freedom of my relig religion in my country, this is so patently absurd that no one will believe him and everyone will understand why he's saying this, in other words, that he's saying it only because he's obliged to. And I think, I, I don't think they think that any longer, I think there was, if they're at all you know, sophisticated about what's going on in the West, but I think there was a time when they may have thought that, and when they were genuinely appalled, some of them, when people, when Christians in the West took at face value their statements. Now, on most you asked about the Ukrainian Catholics. Now, this is a bit more complicated. The church spokesmen do have to say what they say about Ukrainian Catholics, which is basically that the reabsorption, as they call it, of Ukrainian Catholics into the Russian Orthodox Church in 1946 was a good thing and a proper thing and a right thing. Now, the, the state wants them to say that because the, re, uh, of, or the absorption, from their point of view, of Catholics into the Russian Orthodox Church was uh, one of the prongs of the move against Ukrainian nationalism at that time. But there are also many Russians, perhaps even most Russian Orthodox, 
who genuinely think that the right place for Ukrainian Catholics is within the Russian Orthodox Church, because they view them simply as lapsed Orthodox. Well, in the 16th century, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox were won over to the Catholic faith and to loyalty to the Pope and to the Vatican by Jesuit and, and perhaps other missionaries. And from the point of view of many Orthodox, this was a big mistake, which is now, three centuries later, being put right. And it's, it's uh, probably unique, it's probably the only thing about which Russian Orthodox leaders and Soviet state genuinely agree. Yes, sir, thank you. <coughs> Do you think that there, there can be genuine freedom for the church under a Soviet system as opposed to mere legality? without the Soviet system ceasing to be itself. No. Again, shall, shall we repeat yeah. the question <laughs> so that everyone heard it? If everything Walker asked, can there be genuine freedom of the church as opposed to legality in a, in a, in a Soviet system, in a communist system, without the system? I doubt it very much. Um, certainly the, the legal boundaries of freedom could be extended very considerably. Um, whether everyone would consider that freedom of religion <coughs> is open to debate, probably some would, some wouldn't. But it's all so speculative, because the Soviet system would have to change so much that it would be debatable whether it was in fact a communist system a Soviet, or a Soviet system any longer. And of course it is the first communist regime, first communist state in the world. And there are no precedents uh, to be followed. So. One can't really look very far ahead before one, the, the, the possible, possible options start branching off in, in all kinds of directions. Yes, yes. Whilst uh, recounting personal experiences, I have also been quite, they feel terrifically and somewhat lucky, to be able to meet Ukrainians. Um, these are Ukrainians that have come over to the West, and these are still to the elite of the Ukrainian society. These are singers, dancers, sports, sport personalities, people who are tried and trusted members of, shall we say, the Ukrainian society, or that. these are communist members. And it is possible to get past the, what they call the regime, the KGB jars, it is possible to get to talk to them privately. And after a somewhat attractive conversations, and after you've built up a relationship you can trust, you can obviously ask them about certain experiences and what they've seen and how they can help. And in some ways I was very heartened, um, as you probably were, to hear some of their experiences or some of their views on, on religious matters. So for instance, on the question of do you sing Christmas Carol, the story was, yes, we tried 12 years ago, we organised a small group, we put up a little Christmas tree, and on, on Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukrainian Christmas Day, we sang some carols, we were arrested, we were severely reprimanded, we were told never to do this again. And in since that time, so 12 years ago, that particular group has always travelled in the Soviet Union or in the West, so they will never celebrate the Christmas Eve or Christmas Day with their particular families. So the, the other quite heartening thing was whilst I managed to get to some of the, ho uh, actually to the hotel room where these people were staying, and did find Bibles within their suitcase. And they didn't tell the story that they, they would, the last thing at night, read a page from the Bible. On the question of, are your kids that time? The answer was, of course. But I had to travel 50 miles outside the city at 3 o'clock during the night and pay $100 to a priest to baptize my child. But I'll do it. On the question of, can you wear a crucifix? The answer was no. I said, yes, I wore a crucifix. I wore it prominently. But I was again pulled up by the management, the, 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 the people who run the group, and told, if you want to carry on with this group, and this is a professional, uh, professional group, you will have to remove that crucifix. He didn't remove it. He put it under his shirt, under his vest. On the question of carol singing, which is again a traditional uh, a religious facility, do they still carol sing in Ukraine? The answer was yes in the villages or in the towns, no, it, it, it's been forgotten.
forgotten is not allowed. On the question of what do you need, what can I give you, what do you want to take back, the answer was quite clear. It wasn't genes, it wasn't anything materialistic. They wanted the Ukrainian Christmas carol. They wanted the Ukrainian Easter song. The religious songs which they were, in some ways, had been forgotten, were beginning to be forgotten enough. They knew of their existence. But we, as we sit around the West, are allowed to sing to these traditions and maintain these traditions. They wanted to take those back. And I did manage to protect, and I know this has happened, take them back, and they're happy. But again, extremely gratified of all the things they wanted in the West. They just wanted to keep, just wanted to keep it. Well, it wasn't really a question, I think. It was just a uh, very interesting uh, commentary on the spiritual hunger of professional and leading Ukrainians who sometimes come to the West as sports personalities or musicians and so on. I don't know, Jane, if you wanted to comment on that. Might we have your name, sir? We, we learned a few tricks. Bowling, bowling around. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Perhaps give your name again. Yes, I have. Uh, when we call for support of multiple Christians in the Soviet Union, do you know that you say that it has much support, or uh, perhaps we put even more emphasis on the support for the reestablishment of free Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and its liberation from those who have superimposed in the past. Russian Orthodox, which presents now a formula of system to the main group. Well, freedom of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. I think that's very true. I think it is a very important issue, uh, as would be um, freedom for other churches that one could mention, including Ukrainian uh, Catholics. And certainly any uh, religious group that has the aspiration to form a legal church, which is, after all, allowed, clearly, under Soviet law, uh, should be allowed to do so. I find, though, that when encouraging people in this country, and indeed in other Western countries, to support Christians in the Soviet Union, be they Orthodox or of any other denomination, by prayer, writing letters, support, and so on, that one gets the most response if one encourages people to have a concern for individuals and for families, regardless of what church they may belong to. Um, because these questions are very complicated. It's difficult enough for many ordinary Christians in the West to understand what an Orthodox Christian, be it Russian, Ukrainian, Georgian, or whatever is, and, and what the relationship between them is or should be. So I think that's a, a specialised area of concern, an important concern, that should be of interest in ecumenical circles, uh, where there are people competent to deal with such matters, rather than perhaps a matter of, of broad support within our churches. But certainly a matter for prayer and for concern. Yes, uh, Mr. My question is based on what we have heard this morning, no All the individuals of experts are wondering and how far they work to dissipate the facts, the facts about the Soviet Union and communist land. Yet we also have heard there is only about 5% of people in this country that do read or know about. Is there any vision? to penetrate the media, as we have seen now, all organizations are going on television. On the channel 4, we have three expressions. When is this to publish? Mr. Okay. Mr. 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 question was about Keston College's response to the uh, poor understanding of the situation in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. I fear, Mr. Timoshchuk, it was 5% of the British people who really understood it. I think what Roland Bryan said this morning was 5% even of Christian church people understood it. 
understood it, so it was evenly worked. And so Mr. Tim Wachichuk asked whether Kesley College <coughs> had a vision to tell the truth effectively to the West. We've certainly got the vision. Uh, we do understand the importance of this, and it's something that we've been working at for, for many years, I think, to get the media interested in what we were doing. It's been a long, hard slog, and it still is. But I think this is something that does take time. We had to establish ourselves, we had to establish Keston College as a source of reliable information. And that took time. It took many years before people, A, firstly, um, accepted that what we were talking about was a real issue. And secondly, accepted that what we were saying about this particular issue was accurate and reliable. Now, I don't want to seem smug, but I think that battle is largely won now. But still, exposure in the media is, um, remains something that we have to work very hard at. We have been on television uh, when you were out, perhaps, Mr. Finish, too. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Not often enough, I agree with that. Um, now, when we find actually when there's a crisis on, we are uh, inundated by the media. When the Polish crisis was on, 1981 onwards, we got a couple of scoops, not very important, but they were scoops about Lech Wałęsa, and we had television crews and reporters descending on us. And then that was that day's story. The next day they all went away again, and, and it was over. That's how they work. But this last year or so, uh, with developments in the Soviet Union, we've had lots of people coming and saying, you know, what is really happening, what's going on briefly. We've had journalists from newspapers all over the world. We, we have television crews coming in and film every now and then. And radio coverage is, is not bad. Church press coverage is not bad. We always think it could be better, and I suspect we always will. Um, and the best way to get us more coverage in the media is for people from all over the country to write in to the television companies and say, we want to see Keston College on television more. Last question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you give your name? 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 Can you Christian, Christian, Christianity is not much work, it's the work of God. And he knows how to get the answer to the people. In history, there was only one Roman, Roman Empire. It was very wonderful. And Christianity broke that down. So I can't see Russian or uh, whatever to be something about the Christianity. It's a So my question is actually about uh, the media. The British church or the British media is afraid of American Christianity. Is there a similar problem with satellite? Is there any similar fear in Russia? Can Russia stem off the fear of, of uh, satellite communication as the British are fearing that they can do? They then, you know, satellite communication becomes general. The question was about satellite communication of uh, the Christian message. Uh, the question of Art mentioned that perhaps even in Britain uh, there is some fear of an evangelist appearing on a television screen seen by a satellite. Is there any similar fear in the Soviet Union of uh, satellite evangelism? Um, I think the last thing that Russia needs is American evangelists, American television evangelists. <laughs> <laughs> they need evangelists, certainly. They need their own people evangelize them. And I thought for many years that the role of us in the West ought to be to support and build up the churches and the Christians so that they can go out and reach their own people, be it in labor camps, be it in Siberia, or be it just in everyday, daily life. I think that must be the strategy for the churches in the West. As for satellite television, um, I don't think there's any immediate fear until the black market in satellite dishes becomes a lot more developed than it is at the moment. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, one thing that Jane Ellis said made me feel very sorry for her when she said she had to read Pravda every day. <laughs> now, our, our sufferings have been very small this, uh, during this conference. It might have been a bit chilly to begin with, uh, but that was nothing like the suffering of having to read Pravda every day. And moreover, we have so much uh, that's been delightful. We've had that splendid uh, lunch provided by the Ukrainian ladies, and we have even more delights to come. We have the uh, concert uh, starting at 5 o'clock, and I strongly recommend everyone to stay uh, to see that. It will be, I assure you, a wonderful and uh, exciting experience. But of course, the main point of this conference has been the three addresses that we've had, and I hope you will agree with me that they have given us enormous information and enormous stimulation, and also given us a great deal of spiritual food. So, once more, I'd like to thank all three speakers, Reverend Michael Bordeaux, Mr. Roland Bryan, and Ms. Jane Ellis, for the care, for their scholarship, and for the effectiveness with which they put over their addresses today. So thank you once more to all three. I know that Mr. Refluff wants to speak in a moment. Just before he does, um, uh, uh, just to remind you about the, the business items, the Nottingham Support Group will now have its uh, annual general meeting immediately after prayers. Um, and so when we finish uh, speaking, uh, Reverend Canon Michael Jackson will come here to lead our closing prayers. Uh, but uh, before he does, just to remind you, when he's finished, all interested in coming to the Nottingham Support Group meeting will only be a brief meeting if they would all go out uh, that corner and we will walk in, an, uh, in a very orderly crocodile to the, uh, to the meeting room. Uh, so that will be immediately after prayers. And of course, immediately after prayers, those who are not involved in that meeting, uh, there will be tea available. Uh, uh, and uh, if we get over our Nottingham Sport Group meeting quick enough, we should be back in time for tea. Also, there will then, of course, be uh, plenty of opportunity to talk, to look again at the bookstall and at the other displays, uh, leading up to five o'clock when the concert will begin. So I will ask Mr. Raffaluk uh, to speak to you first, and then Canon Michael Jackson will come up to lead our closing prayers. Mr. Raffaluk. Reverend Fathers, ladies and gentlemen, we have received a letter today from the League of Friends of Disabled, the Cedars Medical Rehabilitation Unit, and I thought this would be the appropriate time to read it. Dear Mr. Chairman, I have just learned from the Vice Chairman of Mr. Morris Hopkins that your community will be commemorating this year the thousandth anniversary of Christianity in Ukraine. May I, on behalf of the League of Friends and the Rotary Club of Carlton Tender, our, uh, tender our sincere congratulations to the Nordian community and indeed to all Ukrainians in the Britain on this great occasion. Both the Carlton Rotary Club and ourselves are very grateful for the great interest shown by your community in raising money for the ch charities which we represent. We trust that your celebration will be enjoyed by all and many. We wish you a very, every happiness. Thank you very much.
just for these few moments of concluding prayers, please sit or stand, whichever way will most compose your spirit. <coughs> After a long sit, you may prefer to stand. By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. In one member suffers, all suffer together. We first give thanks for the millennium of Christianity originating in Kiev. We give thanks for what it has meant in the country of Ukraine and in other countries from which it has spread. We rejoice with the Ukrainian nation in Ukraine itself and among Ukrainians dispersed throughout the world. And then we pray for all believers under communist rule, Christians, Jews, Muslims, and of other faiths. give thanks for the work of the Holy Spirit among the Christian communities of the Soviet world. We recognize Gulag as a place of ecumenism and mission and give thanks for the courage and steadfastness of those who are prisoners Pray also for the authorities of the Soviet lands. Pray for appropriate changes so that all believers can play full parts, free parts in the lives of their nations. Then we pray for the churches and other religious leaders in the West. For all those Christians and others who had to leave the lands of their birth in the Soviet world and make their homes in the West. Appropriate means of service and life and witness may be open to them. Now and for it. 